Welcome, good evening everyone. Do a quick sound check before we begin. I got some great news and for Amazon lovers, I got some bad news and uh, we'll get into that in just a second. Um, in fact, Amazon was doing great after earnings report. It gave some pretty soft guidance moving forward for Q1 and in their conference call, uh, as they started to <laughs> talk about spending money, which some investors aren't too thrilled about. They slammed the stock back down in just a few minutes ago. So uh, thank you, Andy, for the sound check and the video is good. This is beautiful. This is a brand new platform um, that we've introduced here at Persons Planet and another new thing that's happened. So um, I welcome everyone. And yes, we are recording this, so we'll move forward. This is a two-part session. Tonight uh, is an intro and then Saturday morning when we're feeling more than likely a little warmer, not just uh, in the uh, Arctic plunge tundra of the Midwest and for all the friends in the Midwest suffering. Um, in Chicago, and I, many of you know, I no longer reside in Chicago, but family members we did abandon and they're telling us of stories of the ice quakes. I guess there's rumblings going on because of the uh, frozen ice tundras on Lake Michigan. It's just bizarre. Um, I, I definitely remember, and I just want to share this quick story. So not that I'm trying to draw sympathy, of course, because I'm not living through this myself, but it's distinct memories. I, I remember throwing a Super Bowl party one year, and the only people that showed up were a few of our friends in the condo building that we lived in because nobody could get there. Car tires were frozen to the streets. So when you turn, you can't even turn a car on. Or when your car tires are frozen to a street, your car turns over. That's a miracle in itself. But when the tires are frozen to the street, you know it's cold. I remember getting off that Northwestern train station and walking across the, Ch the Chicago River uh, and, and making that trek across that bridge with the gusts of wind in the Windy City Tunnel and going down Wacker Drive, making the turn around the Sears Tower. They literally would have these poles with ropes for pedestrians to grab onto so you wouldn't be blown away. And then your next feat was to avoid the, um, as the morning sun rose against the Sears Tower. Uh, and I know I'm painting a, a, a very chilly picture here, but as the sun rose, the sheets of ice would melt off the uh, towering glass hundred stories above you and, and sheets of glass would be falling down on the streets. Uh, just quite a mess, but I don't want to downplay this. It's a very uh, serious situation, frozen pipes. And, 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 and so with that said, I thank everyone. If you are going through that in the, in the frozen tundra and Minnesotans, oh my Lord, you guys really are, are, are troopers. So thank you for uh, attending tonight in New York. You guys aren't used to that, that weather up there. That's uh, pretty chilly. But the good news is just like everything, this too shall pass and we'll, we'll get through it. Just like the markets, we finally got through December and then now January is over and we begin February tomorrow. And what a way to end the month. And that's what I thought it would be great to do a two-part series webinar as to what is working in the markets right now and are there any new tools we need to learn about or are we just looking at older tools and modifying and are the markets coming back into a normal uh, phase or, or are we seeing a normalized trading environment? That's what I think we need to address and, and there are instruments, tools that we can use to lose, utilize and understand that. And that's what we're gonna cover in today and again in Saturday, but not only that, but try to map out a, a trading plan as well as look at specific trade setups. And, and also, as we finish the week tomorrow after the monthly unenjoyment report, we're going to come back here Saturday and we're going to put all of it back to work and show you how we actually develop a plan, a strategy from entry to trailing stop and exits on a few select stocks and sectors that I think are going to be exciting uh, to uh, not just trade, but also to uh, watch for a trending mode as we head into the end of the first quarter. So that's my goal with you guys and, and in this uh, two-part session. This is something we've never really done before because generally speaking, it's something that um, is, is reserved for an advisory service that I started over a decade and a half ago, 15 years ago, um, as well as uh, putting together 
specific indicators. Many of you, if you're a Thinkorswim user, you probably are quite well aware of the PPS indicator that we use for scans. It just simply paints arrows up and down whether to buy or sell. Um, there's a little bit more to it, and we're going to define some of the better indicators to use in conjunction with those buy and sell signals. But first, before we begin, take a quick minute to read this risk disclosure, because as I always like to tell people, uh, despite your emails and despite what others say, trading does involve risk of loss. It takes money to make money. And, you know, just practicing uh, a few minutes every day probably isn't um, the real honest truth of things. So uh, I, I want everyone to understand that the, one of the best is this fourth bullet point or even the third one. Past performance is not indicative of future results. And this use of stop loss does not necessarily limit your losses, as we all find out during. Uh, earning season or during uh, abnormal events where gaps occur and the markets rip right through your 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 price levels. So now that we got that out of the way, all that good news. In 2018, we launched this person's market catcher. It's a relative strength indicator tool, which is fantastic. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on that because it's a unique tool. It's a unique tool for comparing and understanding the condition of a stock or an ETF in its relative performance to the overall market or the benchmark S&P 500. How many people have been hearing more and more analysts are, are talking about relative strength and the trend relative to the overall market? And, you know, ironically, it's not anything new. A lot of us old time traders used relative strength, a.k.a just looking at the relationship of one to another. Um, some of us would refer to it as a spread trade, right? I mean, we talk about, uh, oh, I, I guess I can go way back in the day and talk besides the, the grain spreads, uh, corn and beans, uh, Chicago Board of Trade wheat versus KC wheat spreads. I could talk about cattle hog spreads. I could talk about what's now relevant, um, which would be, well, one more, which is no longer relevant, to talk about the times, would be the TED spread, the T-bills versus the euro dollar. Uh, there's, there's an antique right there, gang, in the trading world. Uh, treasury bonds versus the 10-year notes, the knob spread, which is still a very vibrant spread, by the way, and one we've already had a very successful trade this year out of uh, in the knob spread. When you compare one to another, some people call it a pairs trade, we call it spread trade, but in terms of relative strength, because you can't measure the price of one to another on a one-to-one -one basis, we compare the rate of change in terms of percentage of one to another. And that tells us if there's one outperforming relative to the other. And money in this world is chasing money. So we want to be where there's relative strength, and we want to be uh, and steer away from where there's relative weakness. And one of the interesting things about we're going to cover how to use that PMC indicator for Thinkorswim users is the divergence patterns that have set up because this is going to be, in my humble opinion, a really exciting time to trade. I think last year we noted that um, markets don't go up forever. Uh, markets go down a little further than we all think. And then trends develop. And no matter what you think of the market, I think it's best to pay attention to the indicators, and that's a great life lesson for this uh, closing month because I can't tell you how many people thought, and I'm sure you heard it yourself, that the market couldn't go any higher in January, and here up to the very last minute of the day, the very last minute of the day, the market exploded to the upside in most all of the top stock indices till the very last minute of the last minute of the last day of the month, the markets rallied straight through and through. And many people were prognosticating a correction. It couldn't go any higher. And, and I'm not sure. Some people waiting to buy the dip and others saying that they were going to sell short, thinking the market couldn't go any higher. There are a few tools that were looking very promising that gave us an edge in the market. And that's what I want to share with you because that's, that's basically no one has, nobody, not even myself, nobody gang has the crystal ball. But we have a lot of great phenomenal tools that give us an edge. And we had quite an edge this year so far, and even in last year's market environment. But anyway, in TradeStation, we have a few other things that we put together for our VIP members. Um, we had an Algo 17 Extreme launch, which is a phenomenal product. 
helping traders to auto execute and uh, back test as well as develop algo strategies. And then again, we have our trade navigator, which I'm going to share some stuff tonight. And then we launched J Person Asset Management, which is ironic because who in their right mind launches a hedge fund, which basically looks at uh, long equities or long equity indexes and short volatility right before a major crash. Um, I'm pleased to say it's doing well and it was a, a wonderful time to launch and finally the chance and the time to launch. So that that's one of the things that is is been my main focus getting back on the saddle in asset management for a number of years. So we're pleased to have uh, started that. But that may be why when I do these presentations, um, my, my schedule now has changed dramatically. And that's why I feel it's important to put out the research, put out the work, show what's kind of working. Um, and you know, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of individual traders are still struggling. There's a lot of, I don't, wouldn't call it fake news out there, but there's, there's a lot of uh, people out there still trying to cover the same ground, but haven't modified things to adapt for uh, the new era or the new environment of trading. And I think there are, um, I guess, a way to choose the best indicators for trading in this market. We have candlestick analysis, which is still one of my favorite tools um, that I can pick out uh, the way the market sentiment looks on an individual candle base. And I can see that open close relationship, which is very critical in a lot of my work. Um, there are certain price-based indicators. Uh, we did a webinar, I think, at the end of last year or the beginning of this month, and we shared, like, even on Thinkorswim, there's something over 300 price-based indicators. It's crazy. You know, think about this. There's only the open, the high, the low, and the close. I mean, how many indicators of price do we really need, right? But I think volume is still a lifeblood of the market, but there's a different way of looking at that volume. Market condition. Now, what do I mean by market condition? That's a tricky subject matter, and we're going to go over that in fine detail and I'm going to share with you exactly the market condition indicators that I use to select specific stocks and, and, and where it's working. A market condition could be such as when it comes down to individual stock indices, the advanced decline is a market condition. What is the condition of the advancers versus decliners? Um, when it comes to individual stocks versus the index, what is the relative strength performance? What is the condition of the relative strength? That's an individual indicator. When it comes to commodities, is the market rising with decreasing open interest? Because that ain't a good sign. And open interest is a very important integral indicator when it comes to commodities. So each individual, I've just mentioned indexes, stocks and ETFs, and individual commodities that all have a very unique tool to them that is least used by the masses. More people are liking to want to use Fibonacci and, and looking for the correction and looking at price-based indicators rather than, hey, what is the condition of the current rally? And that's what I got to keep my eye on the prize. Look at the forest, not the trees. We do have a consensus and that is important. When too many people are boat loaded the wrong way, um, you know, and especially people that have a bad track record. I hate to say it like that, but it's true. And one of the, the, the uh, fallouts from the government shutdown was the fact that the Commodity Futures Trading Commission puts out this report every week that reflects hedge funds, it reflects the commercials, and it reflects the small speculators' net positions. In fact, it's not a part of today's presentation, but it is a powerful part of Saturday's presentation. And I'm just going to quickly go over and share something with you. We're going to go over to Person's Planet real quick, my website. I want to show you something that's pretty amazing, folks. So let's go over to Person's Planet. Let's get to the main website and let's get going here, gang. We got, we got a schedule to keep. And we'll get over there. Well, let's start over. Sorry about that. What I wanted to go over was this per the the fact what it what, what we're going to show you real quickly is the fact that the small speculators, okay, small speculators did something very unusual uh, this uh, last December. They went long. Let's see if we're still there together, right? 
We're going to go over here to resources to the main website. We're going to click on commitment of traders report and we're going to get the report. Let me just show you something that's pretty phenomenal. In December, before the big downside in the market took place, let's go to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I'm going to go to short format. We're going to look at futures and combined with options. Instead of futures only, you can break it down into two categories. This is a consensus indicator. This not isn't a consensus indicator. This tells you who's got skin in the game, who's right, and who's wrong. So let's take a look at something first and foremost. Um, we're going to go and look at the Japanese yen. Now, the report hasn't been updated because the government's been shut down and the reporting division of the Ag Department of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission has not been on furlough. So they haven't released any fresh data. But I want you to look at something. The positions as of December 18th, that was the week before Christmas, look at the amount of hedge funds that were short the Japanese yen futures. Look at the small speculators, very short, the Japanese yen. Now let's go down and go to straight to the E-mini S&Ps where you find more and more small speculators and hedge funds all in the E-mini S&Ps. Open interest, a whopping 4,595,000. What was the position? The net position was that the small speculators were net long and the hedge funds were net long. So what's the point that I'm driving home with? Well, two of the most disastrous markets, and we're gonna, we'll take a quick look at this together. Uh, besides Amazon falling off the highs, by the way, uh, Amazon came out with initial reports, it was pretty decent, it was holding up, and then during the earnings announcement, I just wanted to share with you, uh, Amazon didn't uh, bode so well through the conference call as uh, it was announced they were going to be spending boatloads of cash on new investments. But here's what I want to look at, all right? We're going to look at the Japanese yen futures. In the Japanese yen futures, if we go back and we take a look at the daily charts together, and remember, as of the 18th of December, look what, that's the 18th. As of the 18th, Hedge funds were short a boatload of Japanese yen futures. If you're short, you were driven out of the market. One of the largest little tiny run-ups that the Japanese yen saw in, in years. Now let's go over, as you saw, and I don't think we need to paint this picture, but this is the E-mini S&Ps. And quite frankly, from the 18th, they were long the s and So they got run out of the S&Ps with massive losses. They got run out of the Japanese yen. So they were on the wrong side of the market. And since then, the, the odds are they have been flushed out of the game, obviously. So we don't know if we're going to see um, a net change this week of how long that position is. That will be kind of important to see. So when I'm sharing with you uh, this particular information, I'm telling you there are reports when to use them and when to get better information. And again, we look at seasonality. And I would bet that a lot of these traders were long the market ahead of Christmas anticipating a market rally and a market recovery because of seasonality trends. What they failed to remember and why you need to know, what is imperative that you need to know is that Always remember, technical analysis, the condition of the market, the market's condition supersedes seasonality. So with that said, that's one of the main topics of what the person trading methodology has always been about. It's, I'm not a one-trick pony. I've never done just one thing. I've never used just one indicator. And I don't just use price-based indicators. So I'm not going to throw up an stochastics oscillator, a MACD, a Bollinger Band, a CCI, all of those are price-based indicators. I want to know what the condition of the prices are. I want to know for each individual respective market, are there unique tools that are applicable? And the answer is absolutely. So besides, as we pointed out in bullet point number eight, relative strength analysis, the PMC indicator, commitment to traders data, for finding out about futures markets and the ETFs, the corresponding ETF. Is crude oil a sustainable run-up right now? 
should we be paying attention to crude oil and should we be paying attention to opportunities on the long side in the energy select sectors such as the oil services oih and the oil and gas exploration xop should we be looking at maybe simply buying uso if you're an equity trader only and you know what we're going to cover that and that's uh, probably one of the important things that we need to do here is something that i taught over this summer in my specific summer school mentoring class we need to pay attention to the seasonal trends we need to look at industry groups and select sector etfs relative strength and that's what we call the pmc or we derive that by looking at the PMC indicator, the relative strength. We want to look at a volume trend. Now, there's a simple tool Joe Granville created. I helped popularize that back in 2008, 9, 10 era. It's called On Balance Volume. And I think it's been more and more well received through the years. The least likely of any volume tool that I use is the volume histogram. I really don't get a whole lot of trend out of uh, information out of the histogram component, which is at the bottom of your screen. Many of you probably see this. I can't tell if the trend is accumulating or distributing in that market, but I can see individual daily volume spikes. But I can look at this tool here and I can see a distinct trend accumulating in the market as price is rising. I can clearly see this middle tool, which was red, turned bright blue, and it fired off a relative strength, and that is the PMC indicator. So this stock, not only did we get a PMC indicator PPS buy signal, but it fired off on stronger volume, increased relative strength, increased volume. This tool down here that everyone uses, I have no clue what it tells you. It's just red. I have no clue what it's telling me. But these other indicators give me distinct edge in saying volume is trending up, momentum and volume is trending up. This indicator that I'm circling, this particular indicator is a volume tool, unlike on balance volume. So we have specific tools that we're using to help give us better clues at trend direction and breakouts and the health of those breakouts. And that's what traders need to look at. And I'm sure you could stare at this chart. And we're going to look at this because this is like a picture that you should print out if you're trading equities, if you're trading indexes, this is what you print out. And the next time you get maybe a buy signal, you say to yourself, does the current buy signal look like this graph? Do we have strong volume? Do we have convergence volume? Do we have improving relative strength in that stock versus the overall market? Is the volume trending up? If the answer is, do we have a PPS buy signal? Hard to see, it's that blue arrow right there. If yes, then I can make a determination that I can go long the market. Those are the kind of considerations that we look at. Now I'm gonna teach on Saturday a couple other nuances that I think are so powerful of when we're looking for disasters. And when we see such as a trending market rising on declining volume, when we see rising prices, especially stocks, and this is Facebook last year, last summer, a few months ago actually, as it was rising, it was unprecedented. But what was happening on Facebook, by the way, what was happening with Facebook that was rising right before its earnings, which it had an opposite effect this last earnings season, right? Or, or this last earnings report this week, it was rising with a decline in relative strength it was rising with a decline in percent change of volume. On balance volume gave a false reading. And that's one of the things we've got to cover. What tools are susceptible for breakdown right now and what's working a little bit better? When you're trading a stock, you absolutely want to look at the longer term trend of the relative strength right now because it is key critical. This is an old uh, friend of ours. You may... Uh, find it interesting it's win resorts and here's a great example something that you would see and this was not from 1934 this was from just a few months ago eight months ago in fact win resorts everyone was bullish the dickens china was doing good i know it's hard to go back down that far in memory lane but if you notice at point a we were breaking out in the marketplace 
And what happened? On that breakout, the relative strength was declining. So for me, I look at a, a stock that's going to go up. It better go up with accumulation in outperformance of the overall market. Otherwise, it's getting ready for a powerful dump. And that's one of the things that I think we all need to focus in on this next two days that we're going to be spending together. Now, what is the first quarter? What do we see? What strong sectors do we see normally in the marketplace? Well, here's an interesting concept for everybody. Look at this. Energy, XLE, including the XOP, sector stocks, oil and gas exploration, OIH. What a coincidence. They've been rising, and so is crude oil. Material stocks. Now, that's very interesting because we're starting to see material stocks take off. And I'm not talking about gold miners because gold is also on this list that sees a rise. And this is not something that I just whipped up. This is an old slide, friends, because this is the first quarter positive trends that we see in the market. The crude oil, energy sector are related. Materials and gold, slightly related, except for we see like maybe Abemarley, we see chemical stocks, those types of material stocks start to move. And ironically, regional banks and retail. Retail, retail, retail. Now, what retail is that? Department stores or is it retail like maybe apparel stocks? Ah, there we go. We're going to drill that down because that's where we're going to find a little bit more um, opportunities by drilling down into the subsectors of these. Now, let's look at the first quarter weaker trends. Insurance doesn't do that well. Utilities kind of lags. Industrials aren't great. Interestingly enough, remember Caterpillar had a really bad earnings report reaction. Industrial's not great. Healthcare, some of the drug stocks and biotech. And you know, the worst stock, which I thought, the one trade this, this month out of 13 big stock trades this month um, that we wrote, one was ABV, bad earnings reaction. It's in the healthcare. I knew better, but yet it had pretty interesting patterns, and so we went with it. And then lastly, consumer staples, which doesn't mean that they're going to completely trend lower. It means they're weak. It means you probably won't get as much out of them. So these are, the, these are the sectors that in the first quarter, they tend to be weak against the overall market. Now, I want you to stare at this because what's interesting, this is our year to date, our stock picks, our entries, our longs, where the stops were, when we got out, we trailed some stops. And I want you to look at something that's pretty interesting. The one lone loser. We've got GE, which we called as a dog last year, was going to be the darling this year, and we called that right. Oil and gas exploration, we're already in that. TJ Maxx, a retailer. Alaskan Air, we already got out of it. AbV, look at that, red, the sole loan loser. That really sucked, I'm here to tell you. And why? Because I knew better, because it's a drug stock, it's in the healthcare, yet some of the technicals look good. And I need to review what worked last month, what's working currently, and are the markets returning to normalcy? And the answer is yes. S&P is no longer at a 100-point ATR. You realize that in December, the E-mini S&Ps hit a historic 96.5 reading in the 10-day average true range. The three-year, friends, the three-year average three-year average of, of the daily trading range in the E-mini S&Ps is like 26 points. I mean, we were almost four times the norm of a trading range over a 10-day period in December. That is not normal. Right now, we're back down to around 32 on the average true range. So we're coming back to closer to historic norm tendencies in the marketplace. Seagate Technologies. Um, that was a great trade. It came out with a downgrade, and CA Technologies soared. Uh, we took a great average scale out. Occidental Petroleum, still long. La Ralph Lauren, we got into Ralph at a great price. We trailed our stop, and they clipped us yesterday. So, you know, no harm, no foul. A nice almost 6% move. Square did the same thing. 
Best Buy, still in it. Retail, Super Bowl, going to sell a boatload of flat screen tees, and they're going to more than likely, like Best Buy, not only online exposure, but Geek Squad, Best Buy has very dynamic, and it's in the retail space. So when we talked about retail, folks, it wasn't just apparel. It's not just all about Amazon. It's about other online retailers and where consumers are going for appliances, TVs, computers, and peripheral products and service when they have someone that sends a malware to their computer and they can't figure it out. They go to the Geek Squad. So Best Buy is one that we also have picked up and uh, currently have. We've just initiated that long. Overstock, little interesting story there. Got lucky on a pickup. Stock immediately soared. We just trailed a stop and they knocked us out. And that's the next point that I want to make. In this market, I know a lot of you might not like stocks and you may want to trade options instead. Well, when you're looking at equities, besides earnings plays, there's some of these, look at some of these numbers here over a period of time. Since January 2nd, XOP, 21%. I'm not going to look at GE because that was a, that was, that's a different horse of a, a, a different color, so to speak. TJ Maxx, since January 2nd, 12%. Um, look at some of these numbers. AbV, that hurt, 7% down. One loser out of the 13 trades. And then you got Occidental up 2%, Ralph Lauren 5%. So these are not stocks that are giving you um, really a headache, are they? And again, bond ETF, we're still trying to scale in on a short bond ETF. We're trying to sell bonds at 122.33 on the TLT. So that's what we've had, a knob spread. Sold the spread at 25.12, covered the thing at 23.19. And this is what we've done this month just in uh, an advisory service. So where did we get the idea to get into specific stocks? Well, right there, first quarter. Why did I go with AbV when I knew that healthcare was weak? Because it was already down, it was against the shelf of support, it's the only one I went with, and I was still wrong. So I have to tell you, when you look at certain equities and you look at certain sectors, you stick with some of the sectors that are good, and I think that's what is working in this environment, gang. That's not bad shooting. And that was not luck. It was hard work. But it's hard work according to a map. And I think that's the key. It's like what sectors are looking good, but instead of just blindly buying those sectors, I think it's important to, to look at the condition and whether or not the tools match up. And I don't mean any technical buy sell tool i mean logical tools that share what the condition of the market is we have price indicators everyone has moving averages and oscillators and indicators pivot point fibonacci i mean now everyone's a fibonacci expert um just this past weekend i got someone that told me that the market was going to pull back to the fibonacci 618 retracement level i'm like going really you know it's going to pull back really well, when it does, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get information before that, such as maybe we need a trend lower in volume. Maybe we need a trend lower in the breadth of the market. And that, to me, was more important than anything. Um, I'm going to go over one other thing with you guys real quick, if you don't mind. Pivot point analysis. This is something I've shared before in the past. Now, this platform. This is created by, uh, this is Trade Navigator. I've used Genesis Financials charting package for two decades now. Unbelievable. What they did is they programmed this little, and you can see if I took off, and I'm going to do that right now. This is interesting. Let's, let's check something out real quick. I'm going to turn off the um, prices, and we're only going to look at, and I'm going to turn, turn off the resistance, and I'm going to turn off the support. And the only thing left on that chart right now are blue and gold. You see, it's like Notre Dame. Some of you think it's the Bruins. Uh, I know the California guys all think it's uh, UCLA, but it's not. It's, it's blue and gold. It's not a very good Notre Dame blue and gold. But needless to say, what does this blue gold represent? It's the working engine of person's pivots. And basically, it takes the pivot point and it 
compares it the pivot point to the gold line, and that gold line's a moving average. So what this is saying and what they created was, well, John, you say your indicator when the blue is above the gold for the week, a weekly person's pivot, you're saying that the following or the very next week, the market should act bullishly. So they did what's called, a, a, a they worked it into their back end, and it's a li living three-year uh, cumulative backtest study on the relevance of whether or not it's true false. And that's why it's stated as a bear or bull binary. When in the last three years, when the person's pivot indicator has projected the next week to be bearish, it's only been 66.75% accurate. Bullish, it's been 81% accurate. Well, I think we all know in the last three years, if, <laughs> if I pull this out, right? And I look at the last three-year trend. So we go back one year, two year, three year. Um, so since this time frame in the last three years, the market has been sharply higher. But it tells us that the market, even having something over 50%, 60%, 65%, 66.75% 66 of the time, when it says the market's going to go down, it's right on a weekly chart basis. That is not going to guarantee you success, but that right there is going to give you an edge. Hey, if next week's supposed to be bullish, maybe I should wait to see if, if the bullish conditions change. And if it's supposed to be bullish and it's only 81% accurate, maybe I want to buy the dip or maybe I want to trade it that if it gets back above pivot, if it breaks below pivot, gets back above pivot, then maybe I go with a long position. Now, I just defined one of the setups that we look at in our live trading room on a day-to-day -day basis. And look what I just talked about right here. So on a weekly basis, let's say the market opens below the pivot, the blue line, trades below the pivot. Once it starts to get back above the blue line, then the conditions warrant that the market is what? Trading in favor with the technical outlook. That's a very powerful observation. We're going to go over a few of those examples on Saturday So this in this two-part event. Now, what about you guys think, uh, John, I'm not trading weekly. It's too rich for my blood. I'm a day trader or I'm a swing trader at best. And that's okay too. Because let's take a look at the daily analysis and what the person's pivot indicator has illustrated. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to turn off the prices, get rid of the Christmas tree, green and red candlesticks. Uh, we're going to get rid of just the resistance and just the support. And all I'm going to leave is the pivot blue gold relationship. And every time the market says blue is above gold, blue is above gold, that means the next trading session is going to be bullish. Well, bear binary, because in the last three years, we've had both, as it, we demonstrated, an up market, but there's been some pretty vicious down moves. So even in the last, since a year and a half, since June or August, let's go back uh, since 2017 and 2016, we've, we've had some rips along the way. And of course, some dips, as you can see. 80% accurate saying it's going to be bearish, 76% accurate saying it's going to be bullish. Those are striking odds, friends. Those are striking odds. This is not an indicator that you say, oh, uh, where do I get in? This is an indicator that says tomorrow's going to be bullish or next week's going to be bullish. And now it's up to us to say under what conditions with a defined price level. And that's that blue line. So that's a specific strategy for trading that I think is very critical that not only will help us to say, hey, sometimes we the markets open lower, they trade lower, and everyone gets short in the hole, and then it just rips your face off and rallies. And that's what you got to understand. If the market's going to be bullish and it trades down to support, then you better be watchful for a market to break back above the pivot line. And so when the market gets back above the pivot line, then you could look for 
buy signals. So here's a great example at the beginning of the year. Had a big key reversal, green candle, benchmark, engulfing, marabuzo, benchmark, call it what you will. And the next day it opened lower and it traded beyond the pivot. As it starts to rise and gains traction and trades back above that blue line, which is the pivot, it's now acting bullishly because it's acting in accordance with what bullish markets do. They trade above the blue line. So when it's supposed to be bullish and you're trading back above the blue line, it may reduce your profitability from not picking the low, but it'll improve the probability that you're going with the correct technical trend of the market. So that's a keen observation that we wanted had covered that price indicators, that's the difference between the person's pivot indicator, number one, and most other price indicators. Volume analysis absolutely helps me to say, does the volume support this move? Is volume preceding price? Is the volume trending higher? And then again, the last one is condition. When we're trading S&Ps, what's the breadth of the market? A lot of people look at the tick and the trend, and a lot of people still look at the uh, arms index, which is, you know, Richard Arms was a, a fabulous individual. I was fortunate enough to know him. And then not only that, but I think a lot of people, you know, you're kind of mixing up one indicator that's based on a totally different market. The tick, the trend is based off the uh, between the NYSE and the NASDAQ. It's not even based off the S&P. If I'm trading the S&P, why not look at the advanced decline on the S&Ps? And we have that opportunity. And so there are some things that we want to do. We want to cover how to look at different volume. Now let's go over here, and I'm going to change this over to our page and look at this one consideration on advanced decline. And I'm really excited about introducing you to a couple concepts. Statistics, number one. Relevance, number two and what's working, number three. When we take a look at person's pivots, and by the way, gang, we just concluded, this is a weekly chart. Now, I don't know if we're going to finish the week here, because I don't know where we're going to close tomorrow with the unenjoyment report, the market reaction, what's going on. Amazon uh, doesn't seem to have too terrible of an effect on the ES right now, or right this second at least. But take a look at this advanced decline cumulative line on the overall S&P 500. The only bad thing that you can say about it, the only bad thing that you can say about it, and it's not much, is that it, it's not actually higher than what it really is. But I don't know about you guys, but when you look at a week-to-week -week accumulation of stocks. It's not just, this does not just share with you about FANG stocks. This says, and you'll notice that right now, and again, I don't know where we're going to end the week, but the suggestion is that this is the advanced decline only relative to the S&P 500. So what is the um, breadth of the market? The current breadth of the market is that we have a new high reading and we took out last year's high, which the supposition or the assumption is that means that the stock price can go back up to at least test the high. One factor is missing, volume. We need to have volume momentum break out in order to see that move be completed. Now, here's an interesting thing. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100. This is the NASDAQ 100 advanced decline line compared to its old high. And as you can see, it has not broken out to a new high. Not yet. But it is closer, and it did take out the high back from the end of November. So it's kind of giving us the indication that prices are able to continue higher. That doesn't mean we can't pull back in the first month or so. But as long as the advanced decline continues to rise, it's showing that there is a strong commitment of buyers in more stocks than not. Now, this is the Russell 2000. Let's take a look at the Russell. 
It's nowhere near its high. Neither is price. So the Russell right now, there's one thing that's different about the Russell. And I bet you probably already pointed out, you're going to say, well, gee, the volume looks stronger. And that's a fact. So this is a, what, weekly chart. This number will change tomorrow. And that's why we want to come here together on Saturday and start develop a trading plan. From a seasonal perspective, the Russell actually does see some inside uh, or some upside move as we get into the first week of February and into the middle of February. So for the next two weeks, we still remain relatively stable and strong in the Russell. So the Russell, while the advanced decline is lagging the other markets, as you can see, the space between old high and the current level with the breadth readings, the volume is accumulated and it shows that we might have a little bit more upside. In this case, I wouldn't claim that we're going to break out to new highs, but if you take a look at the uh, area in which we generated a sell signal, the area in which the market never could close back above it is approximately the October 26 high. That number is 154.45 to be exact. So 154, look at the number up here, 154.45. How many times did the market try to close greater than that day, that week's high? It never closed greater. All of these tests, and then the market puked. So the market naturally will want to try to go up to test that black line. Ironically, that black line is synonymous with next month's person's pivots. That's an interesting observation. So it suggests that the market in the Russell could see some limited upside, but unless that breadth market really starts to take off, that's probably the end game for the near term for the Russell. That's about another 4% move in the index on the small cap Russell. So that's the kind of analysis that we want to kind of bestow on you guys. What should be using, is it an oscillator? Should we look at stochastics? Should we look at Fibonacci extensions, retracements? Or should we be studying the overall health of the market in terms of advanced decline and volume? And you'll notice that these are my charts. Seasonality, volume, breadth. And, of course, two of my most favorite cherished indicators, both person's pivots and my PPS indicator. So we've got some really dynamic changes coming up in this quarter, in February. Um, here is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Ironically, the Dow's advanced. There's only 30 stocks, so it's not a big deal. But this is also uh, an, an indication that the market is still in a healthier condition. And maybe we retrace just a tad, but boy, for next week, and again, if the unemployment and if the market doesn't crash and if we sustain this move, next week, person's pivots projecting a bullish outlook for next week that extends up to 255.95. Now, we could easily go down first and then next week rise right back up again. From pivot support to pivot resistance would be a 4% move. If it goes straight up and doesn't even look back and goes right up to that resistance target, um, gang, it's about a 2.5% move. I think that brings us back to what's called uh, equilibrium. This is back to where the market started to, what, fall apart from a longer-term historic perspective. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's 250, let's call it 256. Uh, we had one day up and then it failed. We had an area here that failed, an old high, an old low, an old high, uh, an area that the market stalled way over here in January of 2018 before it fell out of bed. A big reaction occurred and a failure. So this is, again, a momentum and an area of the market wanting to go back because it's done it many times before and test that level. The advanced decline suggests that we could easily see that price rise there. And if the market tomorrow, which is a end of week, closes here, then guess what? Or within today's range, let's say, next week's outlook is bullish up to 256. That's why we want to come back on Saturday and kind of say, hey, gang, here's what we covered 
the first night together. We covered certain indicators. We've looked at measurement and we looked at some volume. We're looking at measurement in market breadth analysis. I mean, it's always nice to look at how many new 52-week highs and new lows and how many times that's changed. We, it's always important to look at the McClellan Oscillator. It's nice to look at the arms index, but it's based on the New York Stock Exchange data. It's better to look at the relative strength analysis in terms of percent changes. Now, when it comes to looking at the NYSE, um, that's taking analysis on preferred versus maybe common stocks because there's a lot of preferred stocks there. And I don't know if a lot of you guys know this, but if you're using the McClellan Oscillator, if you're looking at the tick, um, if you're looking at the arms index, that's all based on the NYSE, which we're, none of us are trading the NYSE. And the funny thing is 60% of the stocks are interest rate sensitive in the NYSE, which includes bond funds, muni funds, real estate investment trust, preferred shares, along with 350 foreign companies. As we know, the NASDAQ 100 is correlated to the Fanguli and the biotech. In other words, technology and biotech. But the S&P 500 is broad-based weighted with healthcare, financials, energy, telecom, and transports. Key word was energy and financials. Two strong sectors right now, energy, regional banks. The small cap Russell is growth sector, domestic-based, doesn't pay dividends, most of the stocks, and they're growth stocks. But there's a shoot load, shoot load, just a shoot load of stocks that are in the, what, financial arena, small cap healthcare, and regional bank sector financial. So that's kind of be an important area in why we look at things. Now, I just shared this chart with you, but live. When we see the advanced decline rising and with accumulation in volume, it is not the time to be short the market. And guess what? This market did see follow through rally. This was from last week, this chart right here. And part of my analysis was to look, even though it's like, wow, the market's scary. Uh, how much higher can it go? You know, it had a big scary sell off. And if it comes back to equilibrium, uh, it could easily get back and, and get into the red zone of resistance. And that's where we're at. This relative strength tool, when it comes time to looking at individual stocks or an individual ETF, let's turn real quick and look at a couple examples of what I'm referring to. So this is Goldman Sachs. And you may look at this and say, well, that's not where Goldman Sachs is. You're right. Goldman Sachs is not at 232. But when it was at 232, I want you to take a a look at the condition of the high. The market made a secondary higher high. What is the condition of that rally? Well, maybe it broke out. Maybe people think it's a rising, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever, butterfly wing breakout. Call it what you want. But what I see is not just in the price, but I'm looking at a momentum indicator and I'm looking at the relative strength. If the stock is rising in value and you can see that the green candles were making new ho closing highs, then riddle me this, Batman. Why is the relative strength disimproving relative to the overall market? That is called bearish divergence. And this is a little volume indicator we created. It's actually showing the rate of volume change, not in absolute terms, but in terms of percent change. And as you can clearly see that secondary high came with no distinguished volume attached to it. It was a false rally high. When you see those setups, when the relative strength starts to disimprove and it's on poor volume, that's when you can start getting out the Fibonacci calculator and figure out what's the retracement value. By the way, let's go down memory lane and follow up with Goldman Sachs real quick because we can look at that real, real easily here. If I put up Goldman Sachs, We're going to change this over to a weekly chart. And you say, gee, um, as this thing was rallying earlier in 2018, mid-March of 2018, even the on-balance volume was, why is the stock going up, gang, and the on-balance volume going down? 
Look at the relative strength. The relative strength is disimproving. Now we're going to look at the same time frame in March and compare the apple to the apple. Let's go back and look at the apple to the apple tree. The relative strength, gang, was depreciating. It was turning red as the stock was making a new high breakout. So again, I think that's one of the things we got to look at. Now here's the interesting aspect. Fast forward to now. Forget then. Let's look at now. The market sells off. It's ugly. It's just ugly. But as it's going down, what is the relative strength pattern doing? What do you see happening here since December 3rd? Yeah, it's ugly. It's getting lower. It's getting lower. But the relative strength is outperforming. And then right here on December 31st, what happened is that the person's indicator called PPS fired off a buy signal on improved relative strength outperforming the market. So most of the stocks that we've picked have that same similar pattern. This is thinkorswim. I just wanted to go through and just, just share with you what it is that I look for, what tools are working right now, and why are we using them? Because I think that's what traders need to know. They need to know what the best indicators are right now, what's relevant. Let's weed through the, all the, the BS. Do you really need another price-based indicator? There's nothing out there that, unless you learn how to take breakouts, when do you take buy signals? Do you buy pullbacks? Do you buy breakouts? Where does your stop go? We've got a couple little entry and trailing stop techniques we're going to teach on Saturday. If that's part of what you feel you need help with, then Saturday is your day to come back. But putting it together and saying, boy, before I put together a trade, and that means putting money to work in the market, does the checklist look good? Is this my trade? And if that's the case, then go with the trade. This is an old company, probably familiar with this guy. This was um, a <laughs> restoration hardware. Well, I don't know if they make enough money on uh, selling peripheral products for the home as much as they do. Uh, they have a wonderful little uh, restaurant down here in West Palm Beach, believe it or not. A uh, very high-end store for home peripheral products. But um, restoration of hardware, at the beginning of last year, we started to see an interesting situation. It came from $119 straight down to 32 And look at just like the same setup as Goldman Sachs this year, Look at the characteristics. A PPS buy signal with the improved relative strength, the PMC, can helping to confirm the buy signal and that the stock was starting to outperform the market. That, my friends, is where we can pick up better trades. And that's what we want to focus in on. So from a Goldman Sachs top to a Goldman Sachs bottom, the relative strength tool is going to help us out. Now, this concludes our time tonight. Again, we're having part two, Saturday, February 2nd. I'm here to tell you something. There's a lot of t techniques that, that a lot of people can teach about candlesticks, for example, and this and that. Candlesticks is about price. This is not a market where algo traders are saying, show me a candle pattern that's only price. If you think that, think again. When it comes to CTC, Chicago Trading Corporation, when it comes to some of the very large funds, they are about doing nothing but taking bids and asks a million times a day and ripping us off a penny or two and having algorithms for that. There's also hedge funds. There's also algo traders out there looking at other indicators other than price-based. And I'm here to share with you on Saturday some of the ways that you can take advantage of those nuances and put it together as well as formulate when Friday closes tomorrow after the unenjoyment report, we'll run through another little technique of how to utilize the buy signal scans, what's generating new signals possibly, and where we could find opportunity by taking a look at some of these names. Already, right now, Two names, Chevron, CVX, and Exxon. They're warning that if tomorrow we close at these current prices are better, 
they're generating weekly buy signals. Let's double check and verify that. So we're going to go XOM real quick. And I'm going to change this from a daily to a weekly. And sure enough, there's the weekly buy signal. I'm not too thrilled about the relative strength not confirming that trade. Now, today's Thursday. It's not Friday. So it's just warning you that this might generate a buy signal. Volume looks okay, but the relative strength is doggy poo. Let's look at CVX. Lastly, relative strength improvement. Whoa, it's already improved. It's bright blue. So CVX and the volume. CVX might be a strong contender for hitting our opportunities for trades. And we're going to go over that on Saturday. So this will be looking at setting up real trades for real accounts for next week. And that's what we're going to go over together on Saturday. As simple as that. How we put the work into action. So I look forward. I hope tonight was uh, eye-opening for you. I hope tonight gave you good confirmation of maybe, yeah, this makes sense. I'm not teaching you any thing that's way out of, of left field. I'm teaching what's logical and what's practical and what's working in this environment. So with that said, I hope everyone stay warm, be safe. I'll see you here Saturday. Happy January. What a way to conclude, at least for us here at Persons Planet and J Person Asset Management uh, of using these tools in both real performance and for our fund management. Absolutely. The, the right tools for the right time. And I hope you come back and join me on Saturday because you'll learn boatloads. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you Saturday. The link, James says, what is the link for Saturday? Um, I believe the link, if it's not sent out as a reminder, James, watch your email. The email will probably be of the similar or same link. Thank you guys very much, and uh, by the way, uh, Arthur, you're quite welcome. Uh, stay warm. You know we love you, and I hope uh, you guys are warm. Um, incidentally, this is a weekly chart on GE. Look at the daily chart on GE, by the way. As it was puking and into December and forming that very extremely strong bullish, look at the bullish convergence on the relative strength. How could anyone not want to try to buy GE with that type of wipeout in the marketplace. And so it's real simple. Last year's dogs, this year's darlings. Uh, not a big deal, but in terms of percent, it was phenomenal. So 40% gain on a stock based on uh, relative strength performance. No, it wasn't an overnight trade. No, it wasn't a silly options trade. Yes, I know we could have a, not a silly option. Don't get me wrong. I, the options trades are very powerful. What I meant was it's not an earnings play where we have to go and, and, and roll out and, and repair the strategy. This was um, some really decisive information that helped us be in the right stock. And uh, again, I think it gave us an edge by seeing the confirmation. Somebody also knew that that price was improving relative to the overall market and started to accumulate positions down there. That's a very powerful picture and a very strong argument why everyone needs to know and use this information and this tool correctly. So again, I'll see you guys Saturday. Thank you all for attending.